So we're back. We're back. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> we've we've not ceased to exist, nor have we transcended to another plane of existence. Well, I like spun it as like it's season two now. <laughs> <laughs> sure right i mean we started october yeah. of last year so yeah this is season two um yeah. we had 19 episodes of the first season that's a pretty good run for the first season that's a pretty good run yeah more than one a month if you average it out yeah so i i think that it makes sense now you know if we can get onto a regular schedule but i mean i think everybody's been on this crazy roller coaster ever since COVID and everything where it got really, really hard to live normal life. And yeah. I don't know, maybe now is now is the time to get back to it. I don't know. I need it. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> Some of our listeners have emailed me as well and they were like, I need more episodes. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Hillary and I are going to make that happen. We're working on it. Yeah. And we've been really excited to do this episode in particular. And we, we really wanted to do it in August. And now, oh my, Jeff, it's November. I know. What happened? <laughs> we're terrible people. No, um, we're but we're doing it. Oh, yeah. Today, it's about suffrage. We're really excited about Women's it. Women's suffrage. We're 100 years out. And it's really, really exciting to talk about it, especially this week, because we just had an election where women voting change the outcome of the election most certainly record numbers yes record numbers so join us today welcome to an incomplete history i'm hillary and i'm jeff and we're your hosts for this weekly history podcast So how's, how's the weather been in Mississippi? You know, I was sitting before we started recording and I thought, we haven't talked about the weather in a long time. And I was just thinking about how lovely the weather is in Mississippi. It, the fall here, now I've lived here a full year now. The fall here is incredible. It is so comfortable out. It's so pretty. You get the leaves changing colors you get like the fall vibes but it's not cold i mean it's like in the high 60s today it just feels great i was able to shove the kids outside to play they're running around it's great it's really nice out and san diego has actually been colder than here i've been checking well but it's crisp <laughs> it's crisp. funny you mentioned that <laughs> We're experiencing a little ice age here in California. The entire state, we're all freezing our butts off right now. Sure. Yeah, And I know people from outside California laugh at what we consider freezing temperatures, but we're just not built to handle 50 degrees. You're not equipped for it. You don't have the we're proper- just not ready. Clothes. Yeah. Like what flip-flops do I wear when it's 50 degrees? Yeah. Your, your toes get a little chilly in 50 degree flip-flops. Like it's, we are just not equipped for this. And and it's still like every night it's just chilly and, it's, and we're not used to that. November is not supposed to be like that for us. No, um, no. But anyway, well, I mean, that's wonderful that you're having a great autumn there in Mississippi. Um, yeah, it is. It's meanwhile, nice. we're freezing. Nice. Every night I watch the glaciers grow here. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be taken that's over. That's where I saw a woolly mammoth like running yeah. down Park Boulevard the other day. Yeah, you're going uh, to ice fishing. Ice fishing, yes, all of those things. Um, so women's suffrage, it's 100 years. It's actually technically 100 years uh, back in April, right? Yes. was when it was actually. That was the 100th anniversary. Well, August. Or not April, August. August. August, August 26th. 20th, right? Are we counting the 20th or the 26th? That was August 20th. No. I don't know. I mean, the dates are weird, right? And we'll talk no, about that. So like many it different gets different dates for it, right? There's there's a lot of different dates. And actually, like 2019 was a 100 year mark as well, right? Right. So mm -hmm. it's a, it can be a little shifty. And that sounded really awful. I was like, I don't know. I don't know what date it is, but 
it, there, it's true that there's like different dates that people celebrate, but August 19th, August. I think the month of August is oftentimes celebrated. And actually the whole year, this whole entire year has been considered the centennial year. Of, right. Of, and the 20, the 1920 presidential election is the first presidential election women nationwide are allowed to vote in. Well, not on, not all of them though. Oh. Technically, you're supposed to be able to vote in the election, but shocker, Mississippi, no, 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 didn't allow it. Women did not vote in Mississippi um, in the November 1920 election or 19. Yeah, the November 1920 election, women did not vote, um, even though the federal amendment had passed. There was a bunch of weird stuff going on in the state that stopped it from happening, and the state of Mississippi didn't ratify um, suffrage until 1984, which is another whole other topic, but um, there were, and I think Tennessee was another state that really slowed down. Even though the federal amendment had passed, there was a lot of dragging of the feet of getting the ballots out and allowing it. Um, So yes, November, 1920 technically was the first time that women were allowed to vote nationwide but there were still restrictions in some states that didn't actually allow for women to go to the polls. So. so I think there's an important distinction there, right? The 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 constitutional amendment is fine and dandy, but there are women who are able to vote in presidential elections long before the ratification. Yes, and that has to do kind of trailing back to season one in our discussion of the American West. Um, yeah. So much about women's suffrage um, and you know, the state by state approach that women were taking since the 19th century um, to allow women the right to vote within particular states or territories has a lot to do with settlement in the West, um, in the frontier areas of the American West because of the low population. Mm -hmm. Well, what is, do you know what the first state to grant women's suffrage is? Wyoming. Wrong. Wrong? Wrong. New Jersey. There was a little window Way from 1776 before. to 1807 <laughs> yes, where women were allowed to vote in New Jersey. No, 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 no. <laughs> they took it back. That doesn't count. <laughs> but I mean, there is this window, right? There is this there moment. Is. Yes, that's true. Where women are allowed to vote in New Jersey. So, I mean, New Jersey can technically claim they're the first state to allow women to vote, although then they have to put a big footnote on it. And it's like, yeah, but then we took it away for a hundred plus years. Yeah. So, so don't look too quick, too closely. But I mean, so here's the interesting thing. I mean, Wyoming definitely stands as like the first state that allows women to vote in presidential elections, but States had already been allowing women to vote in certain issues. So Kentucky actually allows, in 1838, Kentucky institutes school suffrage. Mm -hmm. And this becomes a common theme across a lot of the West as well. The first place women are allowed to vote is on local school issues. And if you kind of think of, if you put yourself back in the mindset of people in the 19th century, how they're thinking about this, it becomes a fairly logical extension, right? It's like women are responsible for raising children at the time. They're responsible for children's education. So they would be the ones who would vote in school board elections. Um, But I mean, there's an interesting question to ask, does that school suffrage pave the way for later kind of presidential suffrage? Um, I don't think that the two movements were necessarily related. I think because the issues were different. And I think that the women who started fighting for uh, suffrage in the mid 19th century. So I'm thinking about like the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. And you have Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I think that they were trying to separate the idea of separate spheres so I, I mean, that, I guess that it's definitely debatable to say, you know, that they're not related. But I think that the idea that women should vote in only particular areas, like in school board um, elections or something, kind of cements the idea that men and women operate within different spheres and that they should only be allowed to participate in certain things. So the idea that women, you know, kind of run the home, 
that they have, um, you know, say over what happens in domestic space and that politics are for men. The idea of those two things being separate, I think, is further cemented by saying that women can vote in school elections, but not national elections. So I think when women came along in the mid 19th century and said, no, we really want to be a part of the political arena. I think that they were kind of rejecting the idea that women should only be in certain areas. Is that, would you consider that fair to say that they're probably on different, on different, you know, like different ends of the spectrum maybe? Well, I mean, I think it's an interesting thing because there are a couple of myths or not myths. There are a couple of myths. Yeah, I'll use the word myths. And this doesn't necessarily mean untrue. Myths mean ideas we kind of create to understand something. So this idea of the cult of domesticity. Yeah, that's a really important concept to understand. If you're going to understand 19th century America or United States, I guess, is that there's this idea that women belong in one space and men belong in another space. And so the cult of domesticity is that women belong in the private sphere, meaning that they have uh, their domain is in the home. Their domain is with, you know, everything that happens, uh, you know, inside the home with raising the children, cooking the food, Uh, making clothes, whatever else goes on, you know, the home economics kind of stuff. And this idea is cultivated for the white middle upper class women. Um, The idea that women are too fragile to go out into the public sphere where to go out, to get dirty, to work, um, to get their hands dirty kind of a thing. Um, And that that space was for men And one of the damaging things about that is that that idea, this cult of domesticity idea is very racially and class based. Um, This is not talking about women who are enslaved in the mid 19th century. This is not referring to indigenous women. This is not referring to immigrant women, lower working class, maybe Irish immigrant women who are out working in other people's homes. Um, So, This idea that women belong in the home, again, race and class based, but it becomes kind of the bedrock for discussing white womanhood in the 19th century. And this idea carries over. I think, you know, when you, when you think about the 1950s and the idea of women in the home, and like, you can see that on television shows in the 1950s, um, that idea carries over for a really long time. And it's pretty ingrained in our imagination as, um, as we think about women uh, in U S history. Well, you've got June Cleaver on leave it to beaver, right. Who waits for her husband to get home and kind of gives Ward a drink and kind of makes this comfortable kind of perfect environment at home. And, and in many ways that becomes the middle-class imagination about what should happen, right. That the wife is there to offer a a balm, B A L M. Mm Mm-hmm to her husband as he withdraws from the public world for the day, kind of the rough and tumble marketplace and comes back home and, and to this perfect miniature society over which he's king or ruler or whatever. Yeah. Clean, um, comfortable, warm, cozy, predictable. Nice domestic space. Yeah. Predictable also. Right. Mm-hmm. Now there's a lot of critique about that, right? The cult of domesticity is kind of imagined as a way people envision things. And there definitely is evidence that they, that there is some coherence to it, but it's also not like an absolute historical fact. I mean, it's, it is this kind of kind of looks like it's here, um, but it becomes a way for white middle-class people to differentiate themselves from others. And, so when you start to have like Lucretia Mott and Martha Wright and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Mary McClintock starting to push for women's suffrage, it's an assault on that barrier, right? It is, it's an assault on the barrier between the private and the public. Exactly. Yeah. It's trying to blur the lines between the domestic space and the public space and the idea of politics and women getting involved in politics. It's just considered far too um, rough for them. It's considered that they wouldn't be able to stomach it. 
Um, And, you know, really, when you look at politics in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, it was it was nasty. I mean, um, Mm -hmm. there's a book that just came out recently that I got um, Field of Blood. And it's talking about the actual violence that took place in Congress where they were like caning each other and there's blood spilled on the floor. And I mean, it's it's not. Uh, a lily white environment. Politics uh, are, can be nasty, can be down and dirty. And this whole idea of like being in the mud and mud slinging and all that, the idea like, well, women just can't be a part of that. We want to protect our women from being a part of that because women shouldn't have to get themselves muddied. And, you know, I think that there's another aspect to this that I, I think we could maybe explore a little bit. It's the idea that well, women would just vote the way that their husbands voted anyway, or is that like that maybe that there's like a family vote? Well, there's that the becomes man that's a big gonna critique, go right? For the family, excuse me. That becomes a big critique of it, yeah. right? Yeah. Women are just gonna duplicate the votes the votes of their husbands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but I mean, the interesting thing is that critique doesn't make much sense though. Like, wouldn't you want wouldn't it be good if you're middle class to have your vote amplified? Well, that's the thing is I think that there's the fear that women may not vote like their husbands. Like they may say, think, like, well, it see, doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense for women to vote because they would just, you know, go with what the husband says. But then there's the actual palpable fear that, well, what if she doesn't? What if we have I think a woman that's rebelling the fear. against us? Yeah. 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 I think that's the thing. I think if you if you take that argument at face value, it makes no sense. No, it's like it well, it's like, yeah, dude. So why are you afraid your wife's gonna vote if she's just gonna double your vote? That's good for you, right? I think it is this fear that in secret, when a woman's able to cast that that secret ballot, she is not going to vote the same way her husband does. Mm-hmm. Well, and I keep thinking this idea keeps coming to my mind and um, maybe we can post this into the the website and stuff is that cartoon, that famous cartoon from the 19 teens that shows a woman putting on her bustle and her gloves and she has her hat and she's heading out the door to go vote. And there's a man sitting just helpless with like crying babies on his lap and he just looks so just distraught, you know, and this woman's just like, bye, I'm off to vote. And so there's this idea, I think that like, it's emasculating to men, number one. Mm -hmm. And that if a woman leaves the house, well, then who's going to take care of the children? Will the man have to stay and take care of the children? And so there's this idea that like, if you give women that freedom to go out and participate in the public sphere, they are going to neglect their duties at home to go off and influence policy when we don't really want their influence in policy because they have different um, policy issues in which they're interested in. So I think that that could bring us into a discussion about temperance, which we've discussed in different episodes about women's heavy involvement in the temperance movement. So, so I want to lead with this question then, does temperance set back the suffrage movement? Well, I think that there's definitely a fear uh, on behalf of men that, well, if women start to vote and become involved in politics, then they could very well pass, um, you know, legislation that could stop us from drinking. More, perhaps more pertinent to the 19th century, the mid 19th century discussions, women are heavily involved in abolitionist societies. So there's a lot of men who don't want women to be voting because then that would stop, you know, the slave, you know, slave trade and slavery. And I mean, there are issues that women involve themselves in. And then in the 19 teens, I'm thinking about, you know, the eight hour workday and labor laws and stopping children working in factories. I mean, women involve themselves in causes, in these progressive causes. Urban to try housing to reform. Yeah. Yeah. And they're trying to like lobby for change to make things you know, to challenge the status quo. And when you challenge the status quo, you're challenging white men. So I think that Mm -hmm. there's a a huge fear. So to say, did the temperance movement set suffrage back? Perhaps, but that's just one facet of it, I would say. I think it's definitely, 
something men latch on to, right, as a fear that, look, if we allow women to kind of have the vote, the franchise, um, half the nation is made up of women. What it means is some of the things that we like out in the public space that aren't actually allowed to happen in the private sphere at home, the domestic sphere over which women ostensibly hold sway, those it's going to spill out, right? And that women are going to start to seek to ban morally corrupting things. They're going to that- ruin our fun. Exactly. I mean, and, yeah. and that's the whole thing. It's it's like, and I think if you look at the group that has real power here, which is white middle class men, I think that's those are the ones who are kind of most terrified of this. Um, there's a great book I would point listeners to. It's by Chad Heap. It's called Slumming It. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's about these white middle class men and upper class men who would, uh, and not just them, but kind of couples as well, young couples at the beginning of the 20th century, who would go to places that were definitely not middle class, most often not kind of white Protestant, and sometimes not even heterosexual, Mm -hmm. and kind of sample this other world. But then at the end of the day, they would return back to their house, to the safety and comfort of this kind of idealized middle class white space. And I would say another book, and and I know you get tired of me mentioning this book all the time, um, No Magic Bullet. Oh, yeah. It's a history of venereal disease. Yeah. It's fascinating. It is. And well, I mean, these things is some of these men would go and they would have sex with prostitutes or other men and they would contract venereal diseases. And then they would come back home and they would give their wife venereal disease. And what you end up with at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th is this whole idea that you can catch syphilis from a hairbrush or yeah. sitting on a bus seat mm-hmm. or, yeah. or any of these they things. They make up these myths to cover for their behavior. Right. And it reinforces the idea that a proper woman should not be out in public. Yeah. Well, because there's just so much danger out there, but really what it is, it's there, there's this great, you're right. All these books are great at pointing. There's these issues that aren't related, but they are related. Right. And so when you're looking at, the way that men behave outside of a domestic space, it's morally questionable. And it's mm-hmm. not the way, it's not what they want their wives to see. It's probably not what they want their children to see or know about them. And so if you invite women into that world, your your wives into that world, then you're corrupting them and they're maybe going to see it and go, hey, this isn't cool. Like, stop it. But the other point about it too, just to kind of go back and, and touch on it again, it's it's about class though, because women are very much in the public sphere in these spaces. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the men who are, like you said, slumming it, like the the book explores, it's like they are going to bordellos, right? I mean, they're they're engaging in homosexual activity, heterosexual activity, but it's sexual. Um, in nature oftentimes, and it's, it's often fueled with booze and, um, you know, there's just this whole underground world of fun basically that's happening outside of the domestic space, outside of their marriage. And they, they're wanting to keep those things separate. Uh, so the threat of women entering politics, there's this guise of, well, we're just trying to protect you, but really they're trying to protect their recreation. Yeah. I mean, it's who knew we would get to venereal disease in a discussion about I mean, suffering. it's really easy to get to venereal disease. It is. You it know, is. It, it makes um, sense. <laughs> so, so let's do a clunky segue here and talk about like, so I know you and I both use Eric Foner's textbook when we teach intro U.S. history classes. Yes. And Foner makes it's an interesting textbook. I don't think it's as good as his monographs. Um, It's a textbook, first of all, but I I think he makes something of a kind of dangerous argument about the progressive nature of suffrage in the country. He basically presents the argument that you have to have white, you know, you have to have universal white male suffrage first, then you can expand it to black men. Only then, only once those two groups have it, can you think of expanding it to women? 
So it's this idea that there are these stepping stones to, to fuller participation in the democracy. I mean, what do you think of that? Well, I do use the book and I think that it's accessible and there's a lot of really great things about it. And I think, you know, Eric Foner has had huge contributions to this field. So like, I'm just a pleb discussing what I think about this huge scholar, but I do find the argument to be uh, a problem because I think it's a cop out to say, well, you know, history, first of all, that history is an upward trajectory of progress that we started in one place and then things just got better and better and better on these stepping stones. So it's a bit dismissive of the ebb and flow. It's a bit dismissive of the highs and the lows, right? First Mm -hmm. of all, but then it's also to me a cop out to say, well, eventually everybody was included, but it's almost excusing the discriminatory, sexist, racist, xenophobic behaviors that motivated suffrage in the first place. The the discrimination of people being able to have a voice in government. And it goes against everything that's actually written, right? Liberty and justice for all does not mean for all. It has never meant for all. And we're still fighting for that. And so I think to make an argument that, well, things got better, so it's cool, is it's a little bit of a problem and it's a little of an oversimplified version. And I also think that it excuses to me the absolutely disgusting and non-democratic behavior of, you know, our founders. Um, This is not a democracy. It wasn't intended to be a democracy. We're not intended to have everybody vote. And we still see the impact of that today. You know, last week, we we see the impacts of um, disenfranchisement. And um, well, I told, yeah, yeah, I told some students. Owner's book is a problem for that reason. Well, I told students last week, I was like, you know, African Americans in this country have been fighting for the right to exercise their right to vote. Yes. That they get after the Civil War since the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And even in this last election, they're still fighting to exercise that right. And I think, you know, and this is where it's like, well, aren't you, aren't you two talking about women's suffrage? Yes. But I think it's all part of a package, right? the idea of who's allowed to vote. And and this is not to get too political on this, but this is why when people talk about originalist interpretations of the constitution, I just, I roll my eyes because I was like, uh, originalist interpretations of the constitution then reject on some level, the humanity of African rejects the humanity of African Americans. It classifies them as three fifths of a person. Mm -hmm. Originalist interpretations would be that women shouldn't allow to vote. Mm -hmm. Originalist means you have to take every single one of the amendments. And it was never intended that way. The fact said that the constitution should be revisited once every 20 years. Which is also insane. Right, which is why they embed the whole ability to amend it, right? Mm-hmm. To to override parts that maybe don't work anymore, to introduce new parts that are necessary. Yeah. So I you know, I would I would tell listeners, whenever somebody says they're an originalist of the constitution, be very skeptical about what they're gonna say because there's gonna be a lot of picking and choosing. Yeah. You know, nobody like wants people who take the Bible literally or something, you know. Yeah, nobody wants an originalist view of the Constitution but completely. Maybe some people do. That's scary. I mean, there's some irony in a woman advocating for an originalist <laughs> interpretation just, of the it's Constitution. Not irony, it's ignorance. <laughs> Sorry, I mean Hillary, I, Hillary. Hillary said that, not me. I know we're both very passionate on this because it's we do see the Constitution as this kind of living document that can be changed and is supposed to be changed. It is supposed to be changed. It's supposed to be revisited to uh, to work for the people at every juncture, right? And mm-hmm. there are just some facets of it that don't really work today. And, you know, this this whole idea of that, – that's another thing about Foner's text about this upward trajectory of like, well, nobody could vote and then some people could vote and then other people could vote. There are still people today fighting for the right to go and cast a ballot and to be counted. Um, and 
you see that in particular states where the voter suppression is so strong and it's meant to suppress the vote of the same people that it always suppressed. So working class people, uh, women, people of color. Um, So for example, if it's not too off topic, thinking about I stood in line to vote. I'm in Mississippi. I stood in line to vote for two hours, two hours standing. And it was in the like direct sunlight. Um, Not everyone can stand in a line to vote for two hours. Right. A lot of people have to go to work. People with kids, you know, like mothers who are expected to stay home with their kids, like what should like mom go vote and then, and then dad stays home with the kids and then dad go vote and dad stays home, you know, mom stays home with the kids. And then, you know, that person stays in line for two hours and the other person stays in line for two hours. I mean, those kinds of things are designed to stop people from voting because in the state of Mississippi, you can't vote absentee unless you have a valid like medical reason in which to do it or that you, you can prove that you're out of the, the state. So I'm not trying to get off topic entirely because I'm, I want to bring us back to this idea, first of all, to the phoner text, which we were talking about, that there's an upward trajectory of progress of allowing people to vote, but also that suffrage has, people have been, white men have been hesitant to extend suffrage because oftentimes the people who are disenfranchised are going to vote against their interests. And so when we're talking about women voting, I think that, you know, we can go back and talk about venereal disease again, too. But I mean, like, if women go start voting, they're going to start voting on policy issues that are directly going to impact the happy-go-lucky, carefree life that a lot of wealthy, white, upper-class men had that mm-hmm. they designed for themselves, right? Well, I think, and I think you bring up an interesting point that if we, if we do kind of stick to this, like, well, what does the original constitution say about who should get to vote and all of that? I mean, before we get universal white male suffrage, which is phoners kind of entree into this leads to this leads to this prior to that moment. And we talked about this, go back and look at our, our, listen to our episode about rebellions, right? About Shay's rebellion, particularly, Mm -hmm. um, you had to be a property owner. Yeah. And if you didn't, and by property, they meant actual land property. They did not mean, they did not mean property in some kind of abstract fashion. And it becomes a point of contention between people who live in rural spaces and people who live in these burgeoning cities. But like you had to own property to have a right to vote in almost every state at one point. So what did that make the percentage of people who actually could vote? Is a very, very small little, percentage of people. Very small. By design. By design. By design. Now, the logic was only white men who owned property actually could vote with the best interest of the republic in mind. That nobody else actually had a stake in it, and they might vote for their own personal interest. So, I mean, this has always been the tension about voting is this idea of you're supposed to vote with what's in what's best for the republic. But who as a but whole. what's best for the republic is what's best for these like crippling institutions, right? That we well, isn't that a convenient isn't that a convenient coincidence? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, this is this is the thing. So I mean it's it's like any discussion of women's suffrage is automatically going to start to include these other discussions because it's so tightly bound together. Yes. But I mean, so let's, so post civil war, um, we have the reconstruction amendments, slavery is abolished, um, except for prison slavery, which is still allowed. Um, we should have a whole separate podcast about that. I've just got a lot to say about it. We have a both a lot to say about that, um, uh, and um, black men specifically are given the ability to vote, the theoretical ability to vote. Yeah, and during the Reconstruction era, you actually do see the election of black men into Congress in states like Mississippi, and 
um, there is a short window of time where suffrage actually is extended to black men. But then during the Jim Crow era, which we've also um, had a segment about, those restrictions become tight and access to the polls for black men is completely restricted in the 1870s and beyond. And that becomes another one of the contentions for women's suffrage because the South does not want to abide by federal amendments. Yep. Right. So there's this huge, you know, rebirth of, Restrict. I mean, well, there's this birth of restrictions to um, to black men in the wake of Reconstruction, when the the North really isn't kind of overseeing anything anymore. Uh, well, the corrupt bargain. I'm sorry. What? The corrupt bargain. The corrupt bargain. Yes, and so which which ends kind of the occupation of the South by federal soldiers, and basically allows places like Mississippi to do whatever they want. Yeah, the South still needs to be occupied by federal soldiers. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's the federal soldiers are put in there to make sure that these constitutional amendments are abided by, that are they're followed. And they are, as long as federal soldiers are there for the most part. But the minute federal soldiers are withdrawn, and that's part of a corrupt bargain, it's part of a there's a there's a contested election in 1876, and as part of the resolution of it, a group of senators agree to kind of a, – a, a group of congressmen agree to vote a certain way if federal soldiers will be removed from the South. With and they Joel. do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and it's this is basically when Jim Crow kind of kicks off. But, I mean, it's keeping women from voting. I mean, I think that's a great point you bring up. It becomes part of the bulwark against letting African Americans vote. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it becomes an issue because, well, I think we should go into a little bit about the approaches that women take to vote. There's a state by state approach, and then there's an approach for a federal amendment. And this is all, to me, it's so related to a lot of the issues with the Civil War and in the wake of the war about who gets to tell you what to do. Is it your state government or is it your federal government? And you have women lobbying at a state-by-state approach to say a federal amendment's not going to work because a federal amendment didn't work for black men down here in the South after the occupation ended. And so a lot of women, you know, who were fighting for the right to vote within the state of Mississippi, you're like, we have to just do it through the state because they're not going to listen to a federal amendment. And so They were they were right to a certain extent, but then, you know, the federal government obviously wins in the end, but not until 1920. It takes a really long time for a federal amendment to pass. Women start lobbying heavily for the right to vote in 1848. I mean, Susan B. Anthony doesn't even get to see women voting, Mm -hmm. you know, and so it is. And by 18. Right. And by 1868. You know, um, by 1868, things start to change. So the 14th Amendment's ratified. It specifically uses mail in association with voting. Mm -hmm. And for suffragettes, this is horrible. They could have just left that word out and they would have been able to vote, but it's very consciously put in. But 1868 is actually when the first amendment is introduced to Congress, it fails. It's not for another 10 years that they actually get an amendment that kind of sits and simmers until 1920, finally. But, I mean, all through the end of the 60s, the 1860s, women are really expanding this. Um, women are casting, um, I know in 1868, women are casting parallel votes in the presidential election. Um those votes aren't counted, but it's a protest, right? They show like, look, we're going to cast this vote because we should be allowed to cast this vote, but it doesn't get counted. And then 1870, Wyoming kind of pulls the trigger and allows women to vote. Why? Well, because it's a frontier. So frontier space. I, 
I subscribe to the argument that it's a way to attract women into this space. Because, well, they don't have, yeah, there aren't many women there, number one. Um, it was a territory, right? And so I think mm-hmm. if they allowed women to vote, um, then they could bring women over into that region because you've got all these men there who are just like kind of hanging by themselves. There's nobody to have sex with, I guess is the cruel way to put or a crude way to put it. But yeah, they want to attract women to the territory. There's a lot of, you're not going to have, you're not going to have families, which means you're not going to have the population you need to progress to statehood. Right. And they need to, yeah, they want to be, because they're a territory at that point. And they want that. I mean, there's this whole, go back to our American West episodes. I mean, there's this whole thing about, Territories want to become states as quickly as possible, oftentimes for reasons you aren't entirely clear um, to casual observers, right? A lot of it has to do with once they're states, they can actually prevent a lot of federal involvement in their affairs. But as long as they're territories, it's pretty heavy federal involvement. So Wyoming like allows women to vote. I think it's a way to attract women. To want to come to, to Wyoming. Yeah, most Right. They're like, oh, yeah, I'll go to Wyoming because at least I'll be able to vote there. And this is – so you get this parallel thing, right? So you get Wyoming and you start to get these other western states. Most of them initially start out with the school vote. The Dakotas, Michigan, Minnesota start off with the idea of the school vote, right, that women can vote strictly in school elections. But slowly these get expanded. And then finally 1878 is – when we get uh, a sergeant from California, a senator, introduces the women's suffrage amendment. Which it takes decades to pass. One thing that I really like in a discussion about women's suffrage is the fact that women were not all on the same page as to which way that they should go about getting the right to vote, right? Mm-hmm. It was divided I mean, this is, splits between, you know, between the group. It wasn't just a, you know, a single interest group, I guess. So, and and people, scholars who kind of study women's history in the United States talk about this, right? I mean, it's do, so. Do you buy into this? The the reason suffrage succeeds actually is this last cooperation between mothers and daughters. Hmm. I could probably be persuaded, but I think that it finally succeeds because women start taking on militant tactics to get I agree. Uh, access to the polls. I mean, because you, you watch this really slow march, and I'm not saying that these women weren't d- doing good work, but you see 1848, and then you know the the years just roll on and roll on and roll on, and there's just no movement toward the ability to vote except in these territories and you have women who are part of the national women's you know organizations who are like we've got to do it state by state you know we're trying to be um polite you know well we've got to just go and ask the men to the right to vote you just got to be nice to them and it's not working and it's not until you get this radical split of women who form the national women's party in the 19 teens who learn radical tactics to protest through their work in England. And you see women who were actually in England fighting for women's right to vote there, who start employing these militant tactics. For the very first time in American history, you have people protesting outside of the White House, and it's women. Women were the very first interest group to picket the White House. And they did it every single day. Rain, sleet, snow. They were doing it in the dead of winter, standing outside the White House, like roasting the president. And it's this militant and this aggressive tactic where, and they are met with violence for their protest. But it's not until they start getting this really widespread national attention showing the radicalism of their wanting to vote, that people actually start to take it seriously. It becomes a crisis. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, I think this radicalism is really important because 1872, Susan B. Anthony tries to vote in New York. 
She's arrested along with some other women. She's eventually convicted and fined. Mm -hmm. She refuses to fa face to pay that fine. Um, and then later on, 1876, which is a big year for the United States, there's this big centennial celebration in Philadelphia. She actually interrupts an official program so that she and Matilda Gage can give the vice president this Declaration of Rights for Women. Mm -hmm. So you can see the militancy kind of going up and up and up and up. And I think a lot of people look at that militant period and they just assume women went from not caring about the right to vote to full on militant overnight. No. And, and I think you have to understand it's 30 plus years of like, when are we going to do this? Well, and it's, it is all based off of that divide that I was saying. It's like not all women were on the same page about the best way to go about this. And it had to do with class quite a bit. Um, and when you ha start having some working women who get really involved in the movement in the 19 teens, they just start, they don't have time to be sipping tea with their pinkies up and begging for the right to vote. They go out and they start like burning shit, you know? I mean, I would argue outside of the white house, burning the president's speeches and throwing them into a bonfire. It's so yeah. cool. Well, I, and I think a lot of that has to do with the labor, the, the intersection with the labor movement, right? I mean, it's yes. 1890, the American Federation of Labor officially says they support a constitutional amendment to grant women's suffrage. And I, I think this is them throwing the gauntlet down against elites because- and You start seeing, yeah, you start seeing this teaming up of labor women in labor but then also um black women right who start getting mm -hmm. heavily involved in the movement too because it does become a class thing and you're right like throwing the gauntlet down against the elites and saying we of the working class and the labor are going to start working toward this amendment and we're we're done playing nice and this is what we're going to do now and it takes that teaming up where we've talked about bacon's rebellion right about like it's always the idea to like split people up by their class. And it's the women's movement, um, the suffrage movement that just kind of throws that out the window and says like, we're just all going to work together, even though there was extreme, there were, there were huge issues with it. There were still segregation amongst parties. There was still, you know, oh, there was yeah. still, it was fraught with issues and I'm not dismissing that or saying that women were somehow above um, the racism that was just so prevalent, mm -hmm. but there was a little bit more working together in an attempt to move, to move the suffrage amendment forward. So I would say from 1890 to 1913, we get a slew of States that actually either constitutional amendment or legislation enact women's suffrage. But there's a part of the country that is very resistant no state in a certain part of the country yes. grants women's suffrage. <laughs> it's the South. Yes, but again, if it's related I to- I mean, M Montana, Nevada, Illinois, Alaska as a territory, Arizona, Kansas, Oregon, um, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, Utah, Idaho, Colorado- Mm -hmm. All of these states grant women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. um, but by 1913, it's just stalled in the South. So the Southern States Women's Suffrage Conference is formed, and Black women are heavily involved in this organization. Yes. Um, and it really does show a real regional disagreement over this issue. And it, again, it's so very much tied to strife that root is rooted in the civil war and the idea that you don't get to tell us what to do here. We run things the way that we want to run them. The federal government isn't going to come in and tell us anything and we don't want women to vote and we're not going to do it in the state level. And I find it so interesting that even when the federal amendment does pass, that it takes decades for the states to ratify it. Even though they, can, even though women can vote, it takes until the 1980s, 80s for states like Mississippi to say, okay, fine, women can vote. 1984. I mean, mm -hmm. 
And it, and it all, again, stems from this idea that, well, if we start listening to federal amendments, if we start listening to the federal government, then that means that they control us. And there's this whole, you know, states' rights, states' rights, states' rights. And they're just still fighting the Civil War. I mean, they still they still are in so many ways, right? But it's like there are just there's just so much um, consternation over you know federal law and federal rule, mm-hmm. and and um, it, it al- always boils down to just wanting to keep these regions run by a very small number of white men. That have elite money, women. elite, yeah, have money, they're educated, they have generational wealth. Um, and that's who who runs the state still. They still run the state. So So my favorite act of suffragette resistance is December 2nd, 1916. So they fly, I love this, they fly, something they couldn't have done before. They have a plane that flies over President Woodrow Wilson's yacht. And they litter the yacht with suffrage amendment petitions. Yeah. They did so many cool things. They, I mean, they, they yeah. were so innovative in being pains in the asses, right? Mm-hmm. They were just out there. Well, they block day. traffic. Yeah. They- Marching up and down the streets. They have their little sashes on. And I mean, they were hardcore every single day, just ab- complete civil disruption on a day-to-day basis, demanding, demanding the right to vote. And they were dragged through the streets. They were arrested. They were imprisoned. They went to work camps. They were force fed when they would go on hunger strikes. They were, you know, in flea infested jail cells. And these are like white middle upper class women who are getting thrown into jail. This starts to get a huge amount of national attention. Because it's like, ooh, we don't want to see these ladies in jail, right? I mean, and you can say a whole bunch about that, about, you know, trying to protect white womanhood. But, you know, there was, it was organized. It was an organized movement. And I, when I teach this, I often, I'll show the uh, film Hillary Swank and Iron Jawed Angels. I don't know if you've seen mm-hmm. that one. Uh-huh. I like that one. So. I want to talk a little more about the acts of resistance because I think they're so interesting. I mean, Wilson, Wilson promises a lot to many groups during World War I. Um, very few of those promises appear to be kept. And actually, Wilson promises in 1918, he actually promises women, he addresses the Senate and says, we will grant women the right to vote after the war is over. Mm-hmm. And we women do participate in the war effort with the intention, mm-hmm. with the promise of being offered the right, yeah, to vote. So starting, so uh, starting January sixteenth of nineteen nineteen, women set up this this urn that can be seen from the White House front door, where they burn the hypocritical speeches of Woodrow Wilson about democracy, and they call it a watchfire for freedom. Mm-hmm. And, they, and there's somebody manning it, isn't it? Twenty four seven. Yeah, twenty four seven. They are keeping. It is like an eternal, perpetual flame mm-hmm. of watchfire for freedom, right? And so they are. I mean, you can see this that women are now just calling the president out on his BS. Mm-hmm. Um, so the House passes the suffrage amendment May twenty first, nineteen nineteen. The Senate finally passes it with a couple of votes to spare. Um, you know, from, so from 1878 to June 4th, 1919, that amendment has sat in Congress and not moved at all. So now June 4th, why? <laughs> it gets brought up a couple of times and it always fails for various reasons, right? But I mean, this is a lot of critics would say this is the problem with having a group that already has something like the vote. Voting on the ability of there others who don't have it to vote. Um, be able, exactly, exactly. Because it, what it, what good does it do them? 
And there's a fear yeah, at water that's down their power. Right? It's uncomfortable to say that, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But what what's their motivation? Oh, just out of the goodness of their hearts? Not likely. They have to be shamed, publicly humiliated on a daily basis, a perpetual thorn in the side of Woodrow Wilson before before they're granted their right. Is that yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So finally, August 1920. We get the last required states. Tennessee officially becomes the state um, that kind of tips it over. Um, a southern state, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then August 26th, the Secretary of State signs it and it becomes law. Um, it becomes part of the U.S. Constitution. Um but even then, I mean, think about that. August 26, 1920, women now officially nationwide have the right to vote. 100 years pass before a woman is elected to one of the top two positions of the country. Mm-hmm. And the disparity still of women serving in government, we have made huge strides in the past couple of years. But it's still a big hill to climb. And it's, you know, not until 2016 that you have a woman running for president that's a major, you know, considered candidate. And she loses. But I mean, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing is you do have women who run even before women have the right to vote. You've got some women that run for president. But it's not until that 2016 campaign that a woman is actually viewed as having a credible chance of actually winning. Yeah. And in fact, better than a credible chance of to win. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's that right there. I mean, the hundred year gap right there. hundred years? One hundred years? A hundred years. A hundred years. And we're so still I want to talk, I want to talk about kind of symbols of suffrage. And I want to talk about one that's very important because um, our vice president elect wore a dress the other day. A white dress. So why is white important for suffrage? Why is the color white in a dress important for suffrage? Well, there's there's white and there's um, blue and yellow flowers and there's animals that are connected, right? Or, like the blue or is it purple? I thought it was purple. The purple, well, the colors of the flag were purple, white, and gold for the right. National Women's Party. Um, but then they would wear the men would wear flowers when they would go in to vote to to indicate which way their vote was going to go. Um, mm-hmm. So the women who wore white in the suffrage parades, um, they were it's like this white color is uh, white color <laughs> wearing white um, in the parades. It was like a symbol of femininity, purity. Um, and so I, I'm a little, I, I'm a little confused as to why it, well, we've like taken this as being a thing we should do. But go ahead. Well, it's one of the three colors, right? And it's just adopted as a as a symbol of the purity of the woman's vote, and the idea that um, that that kind of is a hallmark of women's suffrage, and it's a reminder of women's suffrage, right? Um, and we actually have this. We've seen some. Women who are members of Congress have done this recently, right? They, they're in the yeah. state, state of the Union address. They wear right because it's to raise awareness of kind of women are present here. Um, I mean, women constitute more than 50% of the population of the United States. Yes, we do. But they don't even come close to constituting 50% of the elected positions. In elected the officials, States. right. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Mm-hmm. I don't like the white thing though. I mean, I, I, I get it and like, I see it and I understand that it's like a solidarity thing, but the basis of the symbol is symbolizing purity, much like virginal purity of like a bride wearing white or something. I, I see that as like kind of is it, the symbol in and of itself is rooted in a sexist idea. So I'm not pumped on true, it, but now true. I do understand maybe it's being like repurposed. 
Well, I mean, we know this happens a lot in communities that have been previously marginalized, right? They take former symbols of their oppression mm-hmm. and they repurpose them to something that actually they use. As a symbol kind of, of solidarity. A, yeah. Right. Right. Um, Maybe I just don't like wearing white. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially after Labor Day. I mean, if you're in the South, you better you better get with that program. Um, but I mean, it's. If you think about it, it is um, – they have to agree on some color, yes. right, when they want to do these symbols. And, and it's a convenient one because it is one of these. So if you look back, so Shirley Chisholm, who's the first African-American woman who's elected to Congress, she actually wears white in her victory speech. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Geraldine Ferraro, who's the 1984 – Democratic Party vice presidential nominee. She's the first time one of the two major parties nominates a woman for one of those positions. She wears all white at the convention in her acceptance speech. Hillary Clinton in 2016 at the Democratic convention wears all white Mm -hmm. when she accepts the nomination. Uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez wears white when she's sworn in as a member of Congress. And then we have Kamala Harris, who wears white when she gives her first speech as vice president-elect. So I think it's it's even if we're kind of a little uncomfortable with kind of the where this comes from, I think at this point it's been repurposed enough that maybe it's shed some of those older meanings. And, and maybe that's the important thing, right, is to kind of repurpose it. But I mean, it's it's – the reason I brought up there's a lot of work to do is that there is, right? I mean, it's why aren't 50% of elected officials women? Mm-hmm. Yeah. there. And why, why is our government so old? I mean, I think that that's a huge well, there's, part there's of another it. Another issue as well. Right? Yeah. But that's, but that's a really big part of it. As you see the younger generation coming in, you do see a lot more women. And that's Mm -hmm. exciting to see because I do think that in my lifetime, we will see uh, perhaps a more equal equal representation, I think. Um, But it's a ridiculous situation, right, where it has taken 100 years to even start to see the swing in in percentages. Um, The Supreme Court is interesting, right, because Mm -hmm. we do have women – serving on the Supreme court now and in roles, you know, these lifetime appointment roles. Um, and that's a great, uh, th- those, there's been some great strides there for women. Well, there's more equity in the Supreme court at this point, as far as women being represented than there is in Congress, I think. Correct. Yes. Oh, most well, certainly percentage. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's a little surprising because the Supreme court's supposed to be the most conservative body of the government. Well, I think it is right now. Well, but I mean, conservative in that it it really does not change much at all. Right, because of the um, lifetime appointments. Because of the lifetime appointments. And, you know, so, yeah, it's, um, yeah, this has been great. I, I, I think we need to have a follow-up episode, not immediately, but at some point. I think we need to have a follow-up episode where we talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. Yes. Can we follow Which, its history? There through? was a lot of work to pass it. Alice Paul carried that torch for her, you know, after um, the the suffrage amendment passed and it has not passed. Um, I also think that there's something to be said about your knowledge of fashion that we maybe need to explore because you were able to name all these, these women wearing white. And I think that's great. And because there's so much symbolism, right? There, there is a lot of symbolism in, in fashion historically. So maybe sometime we could do one of those for fun. Fantastic. Well, we are back on a regular schedule. We'll, we will be back. We will uh, be look back. for a new episode soon. Um, we, we, I'll be back. Um, we'll be back. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm Jeff. And I'm Hillary. Thank mm-hmm. you.